if I just might for a moment on a personal note, tomorrow I celebrate 48 years in the priesthood. 46 years ago, I would have never thought that one of my goyans in Portland, Maine, would be here with us today as a renowned international speaker. We are so proud of Dr. Elizabeth Prodromo. She was a gem as a, as a young, youngster in our community, close to her and her family, and they, they are always in our prayers. And so we are very blessed to have her with us. And I know you'll receive a formal introduction. Yeah. Reverend Fathers, the Honorable Mr. Demetrius Fados, uh, General Consul of the Hellenic Republic of Greece, thank you for being here. Uh, Honorable fellow Archon and Congressman of the United States, the Honorable Gus Belarakis, thank you. The Honorable George Kuditikos, Mayor of Clearwater. Fellow Archons, ladies and gentlemen, uh, presidents uh, and officers of the various Greek American organizations in the area, thank you all for being here. It's a great pleasure to see so many faces and to show interest in tonight's topic, the threats confronting the ecumenical patriarchy, why Americans should care. That's the key to this. We often are guilty, as, of, as are many groups, of talking to ourselves. We know what issues confront us, but do our friends, do our neighbors, do those people that we work with know what's going on in our community and worldwide that affects not only us, but them that they may not know about. I'm gonna get into that in a little bit. But first, I would like to invite our co-sponsor, the Honorable Gus Pilarakis, who heads up the Congressional International Religious Freedom Caucus to give us his comments and enlighten us on what he's doing in Congress as well. Thank you. Thank you, Appreciate it very much. I probably don't need this, but just in case. Uh, and and uh, Dr. Lavos is right. Uh, we we need we know we don't we can't just speak to ourselves uh, anymore. We've got to get the word out, and uh, I'm so happy. That the Dr. Lapos and, and the clergy, the wonderful clergy here, and all the organizations have invited people outside of our community, bring them in. We're all God's children, and uh, we need to stick together. Um, so I do have some prepared remarks. Uh, it's great to see so many people come out to be informed about this important topic. Many thanks to, of course, Dr. Vlahos, the Archons of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, and of course, this wonderful church, Holy Trinity. And I, I can't wait to see the inside of the church. I know it's beautiful. You have brought down one of the most, the foremost authority on Turkey and the Ecumenical Patriarchate. Uh, I'm a big fan. Uh, goes without saying, I'm a big fan of Dr. Prothromos. Uh, I have hosted Elizabeth for numerous Capitol Hill briefings as co-chair of the International Religious Freedom Caucus. In addition to focusing on the religious rights of the Orthodox Christians in Turkey, the caucus has hosted a variety of briefings that have dealt with global anti-Semitism and the rights of religious minorities in North Africa, uh, the Middle East, and in Southeast Asia, and just to name a few. In fact, some of our friends have joined us here tonight uh, from the Coptic Orthodox community. I believe Dr. Assad is here. Uh, and then we have some folks from the Jewish community, uh, as well as we have friends from the Pakistani Minority Rights Commission. 
Religious freedom, as you know, is an issue that personally touches me as I've had family and friends who have been victims of religious persecution, as you have as well. This makes me especially conscious of the incredible importance of ensuring that religious freedom is respect, respected around the globe. As you know, in the Middle East, uh, it was predominantly uh, Christian. Now, just a sliver of the Middle East, and I could go through the countries, but I don't want to take the time away, because uh, you, you're going to hear from a real expert, Elizabeth, in a few minutes. Uh, folks, uh, I did have a chance to visit uh, Constantinople, and it will always be Constantinople to be. And uh, a lot of the folks up there tell me, gosh, give it up, never, never will we give up the volume. So uh, I did have an opportunity to, uh, to visit uh, with my chief of staff, Elizabeth Hintos, and my wife, uh, and we did go to Constantinople, we went to Hagia Sophia, uh, and, and also to the Ecumenical Patriarchate, and we visited the, uh, the seminary at Haki. What a beautiful place. I don't know, how many of you have had a chance to go to Haki, the seminary? One of the most beautiful places that, that I've ever seen. And it's ready to open. Uh, and it's been ready to open for years because of your generosity over the years, supporting the seminary. And the high school, by the way. We have a, a principal without classmates, uh, without uh, students there. But again, we're not gonna rest until that spoliet is open. I've made uh, several gestures. I've actually spoken to the President of the United States about this issue uh, on, on two occasions. So again, religious freedom is a fundamental human right outlined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And we know that President Erdogan and the Turkish government continue to routinely violate this human right by the reprehensible treatment of our ecumenical patriarchate, the Holy See for over 300 million Orthodox Christians uh, faithful worldwide. The Turkish government has failed to recognize the ecumenical patriarch's international status. It has limited to Turkish nationals the candidates available to the Holy Synod for selection as the ecumenical patriarch. It has failed to reopen our beloved school of theological scholi at Haki, thus impeding training for the clergy, and has confiscated 75% of the ecumenical patriarchate properties. Uh, we need to get the word out, folks. I do in Congress. We need to get the word out to our fellow Christians and religious minorities throughout the world, uh, because I know they will help us through Christ. Turkey's recent offensive in northern Syria is also extremely concerning. Their offensive has resulted in civil civilian casualties and I fear, because we know too well, I fear vulnerable ethnic and religious minorities will endure a disproportionate amount of the suffering as Turkish presence in Syria continues. And I voiced voice my concerns with the administration with regard to that. I know we're not gonna get into politics tonight. No. There have also been accusations of egregious human rights violations, which we absolutely cannot stand by and let happen. Thankfully, a bill I co-sponsored, the Turkey Sanctions Act, and a resolution that would officially recognize, finally, overdue, would officially recognize the Armenian Genocide. And we also included our Hellenes in there because that was genocide as well. Uh, and, and the Assyrians and the Syriacs uh, and, and more groups, uh, religious minorities. But it overwhelmingly passed the House last week marking an encouraging change to the United States' willingness to hold Turkey accountable for its actions. <laughs> Folks, we've been trying to pass this resolution uh, with the Armenian community for many years, and finally people are waking up. 
and I'm so happy I had the opportunity to co-lead, to co-lead that resolution, the Armenian Genocide Resolution. Uh, and I was one of very few speakers because people still fear, fear the Turkish law, but they voted for it. So that's a good start. I will continue to be a voice in Congress that holds Turkey accountable for its human rights violations and complete disregard for international law. This type of behavior from a so-called secular democracy, a NATO member state, and a supposed ally of the United States is simply deplorable. I appreciate the community working to actively inform our friends and neighbors, because I know it will be helpful to us. Uh, inform your friends and neighbors about these issues, and I look forward to hearing from Dr. Prodromo. Thank you very much, and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman, and to me, more importantly, fellow Archon, Gus Pavarakis. So let's get back to the topic on hand. Threats confronting the ecumenical patriarchy, why Americans should care. That takes for granted that we know what that topic means. But I was talking to my good friend, Joko Kolakis, yesterday, who told me that as he was spreading the word about this lecture, to Americans who should care, okay, our fellow Americans. Many of them had no idea what an ecumenical patriarch was, who he was, and many people don't know even what Constantinople is. So let me set the stage. Indulge me for just a minute or two with a high-speed train ride through history. All right, all the way back to 33 AD, Twelve fishermen sitting in a room uh, upstairs, ups, uh, in an upper room, upset because they just lost their leader, and all of a sudden a rushing wind comes in, and tongues of fire appear over their heads, and they're filled with the Holy Spirit, and they understand everything that they went through and witnessed. And then they're sent to the far corners of the world to make disciples of all men, in the name of Jesus Christ. Some of those disciples we know well. We know the Apostle Peter, the head of the disciples. He went to various places. He started a church in Antioch. He went and finished his ministry and died a martyr's death in Rome and is considered the, the first Pope of Rome, the apostle to which all, for, all subsequent popes derived their authority. Well, we know that Peter had an older brother. His name was Andrew. Andrew went all, uh, to many places too, and he went to this far corner of Europe that was directly across from the Straits of Asia Minor to this little Greek town called Byzantium. A little backwater town. And he starts a church there and appoints a successor. Fast forward, 200 something years later, Emperor of the Romans named Constantine sees a vision in, and in the sky with a cross and says, in, in this sign you conquer. He wins, he becomes undisputed emperor. He issues an edict of toleration for Christianity, whereas before they've been persecuted to the point almost of extinction. Emperor Constantine decides he wants a new start. He moves the capital of the Roman Empire over to the east, in the center of what was then most of the empire, to this little town of Byzantium. And he calls it New Rome. But everybody else called it the city of Constantine, Constantinople. As Christianity thrived, the major centers, the major cities, their bishops became of increasing importance to the point where five were considered major centers. Rome, of course, the venerable capital of the Roman Empire. Constantinople, this, the new capital of the Roman Empire. Alexandria, the third largest city in the empire. Antioch, where they were first called Christians. And of course, Jerusalem, because that's where 
our, our Lord and Savior was crucified and resurrected. These five centers became patriarchates. In the Fourth Ecumenical Council, I know this sounds like, you know, ancient stuff. It is. Fifth century. Fourth Ecumenical Council. The worldwide church gathers together to, to find the answer to certain controversies. They debated many things. At the end of that conference, they passed a canon establishing that the Patriarch of Constantinople, by virtue of being the capital, would be called the Ecumenical Patriarch and be responsible for all the lands outside of the jurisdictions of the other Patriarchates. Fast forward a thousand years, 1453. The, the Eastern Roman Empire that we affectionately call Byzantine Empire today falls to the, after years and centuries of onslaughts from many enemies, finally falls to the Ottoman Empire. And Christianity becomes a second class religion and the Greek Orthodox are under um, the domination and subjugation of the Ottomans. There's no more emperor. The Ottomans appoint the patriarch as the head of the Orthodox people throughout. He's the, uh, the head of the Rum Milet, or the Orthodox nation, and he's responsible for all their actions under the Ottoman Empire. When the sparks of freedom started going around through Europe, in the late 1700s, early 1800s, that finally erupted into like the full-fledged flames of rebellion in 1821, when all of the Orthodox people in what is now Greece, whether they were Greek-speaking, Albanian-speaking, Serbian-speaking, Vlach, Sarakatsani, all the pe different people who didn't even really have a national identity then, they called themselves Rum, Rome. Romans. They knew that they were Christian and Orthodox and that was it. Subsequently, we developed our national identities, which we appreciate. But they considered themselves subjugated Christians fighting the Ottomans. Well, when they rebelled, the Turks took it out on the ecumenical patriarch because he was the leader of their nation. So on Easter morning, 1821, right? Um, they marched into the Patriarchate with a letter deposing the Patriarch, immediately ordering the Holy Synod to have an election for a new Patriarch. And they took the old Patriarch, Gregory V, still in his robes from the Easter service, still in his holy robes, took him out into the courtyard to the gate in front of the Patriarchate and hung him. His body was left there for three days before a, a, a rabble crowd cut him down, dragged him through the streets and threw him into the Bosporus. Things haven't gotten much better. Since that time, the Patriarchate has been subject to incredible institutional persecution. The Greek Orthodox population which at the time of the end of uh, the Greco-Turkish War in 1922, there was 100,000 Greeks allowed to stay in Constantinople and 100,000 Muslims allowed to stay in Eastern Greece. There are now, I believe, over 300,000 Muslims in Eastern Greece. There are less than 1,500 Christians of the Orthodox, of Greek Orthodox faith in Constantinople. I think that speaks for itself. That sets the stage. Thank you for indulging me. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker. I had the pleasure to meet Dr. Prodromo nearly 10 years ago when the Archons held a conference at the European Union in Brussels, Belgium uh, called Building Bridges. And uh, we discussed and uh, had presentations to all of Europe, basically, uh, regarding religious freedom, the ecumenical patriarch, and Dr. Pondromo was one of the leading speakers and authorities. Dr. Elizabeth Pondromo is a visiting associate professor of conflict resolution 
at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. She's a non-resident fellow at the Hedaya International Center of Excellence for Countering Violent Extremism in Abu Dhabi, and a senior fellow in national security and international policy at the Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C. In addition to her diplomatic service as vice chair and commissioner on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom from 2004 to 2012, she served in an advisory capacity as a member of the U.S. Secretary of State's Religion and Foreign Policy Working Group from 2011 to 2015. Her research focuses on religion and geopolitics, and she is a well-known expert on Orthodox Christianity and Islam. Her current research focuses on the security and human rights implications of Christian sustainability in a religiously plural Middle East, as well as on Greece as a critical case study of how mixed migration flows are reshaping the religion security nexus in Europe. She has published widely in scholarly and policy journals and is a frequent contributor and commentator in international media. She holds a PhD and an SM in political science from MIT, an MALD from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and a Bachelor of Arts in International Relations and History from Tufts University. She is co-editor and contributor for Eastern Orthodox Christianity and American Higher Education and Thinking Through Faith, New Perspectives from Orthodox Christian Scholars. And to me, I am, feel honored to call her a friend. I would like you to give, uh, help me give a warm welcome to Dr. Elizabeth Cabrera. extension to His Eminence Metropolitan Alexios uh, for the kindness of this invitation. It's really an honor. Uh, I, I want to thank everyone for an incredible Florida hospitality. Uh, I'm amazed at how people smile, greet me, um, don't try to run me over when I'm walking in a crosswalk. These are remarkably different than the daily experience in, in Boston, so it's really great to be here. Um, I also want to thank um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ted and Lisa for your hospitality as well. Thank you so much. Uh, to fathers here in, uh, in this parish, uh, particularly to Father James and President Vaso, it's been just wonderful to see you all. Uh, I wouldn't be here without them. Uh, they exercised a formative impact on my life and the life of every Greek Orthodox youth that they touched during the five years they were in Portland, Maine, and they taught me about the meaning of service and love for Christ and the church, and the importance and the responsibility of serving the church, but also sharing our faith with others, with other Orthodox, with people who aren't Orthodox, and uh, the importance of having an open heart and absolute respect for everybody's beliefs. So thank you so very much, um, and my dear friend Ann Baziotis. Uh, partner in crime as a kid. And then finally also to Congressman Gus Polarakis, it's an honor to work with you and thank you for the things that you said and to his chief of staff, Liz Hitos, but I don't know where you are. Oh, Liz, we're in the back, okay. So thank you to everyone, and please, if I've forgotten anyone, I, I, I apologize. Let me turn to the subject at hand for this evening, uh, existential threats confronting the ecumenical patriarchy, why Americans should care. I'm going to begin with a quote from the great 19th century English writer and social critic, Charles Dickens. He opened his classic novel, A Tale of Two Cities, with the following words. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. 
Now Dickens was describing a time of controversies and contradictions that defined the years of 1775 to 1792 with reference to the two cities of London and Paris. This is a period of great tumult, great upheaval with the events of the French Revolution, which for French subjects was a spring of hope, but for the Ancien Regime, it was a winter of despair. Now the literary device employed by Dickens in this introduction to the 1859 novel is known as paradox, which as many of you know is a Greek word that means contrary to expectations, existing belief, or perceived opinion. And paradox describes a seemingly contradictory proposition, which upon investigation proves to be true. Now, my brief literary uh, excursus here may seem to be a peculiar starting point for our topic at hand, but I hope to convince you by the end of my remarks that the topic is actually defined by paradoxes. First, in many ways, the present moment should be the best of times, and in some ways is the best of times, for the ecumenical patriarchate of Constantinople. But paradoxically, clear and present threats of an existential nature to the economical patriarchate also make this the worst of times for the Fanar. And then another paradox. Although many American citizens and U.S. policymakers may view the issue of the survival of the economical patriarchate as a narrow Greek-American niche issue or a parochial Orthodox Christian issue, in fact, paradoxically, the health of this millennia-old institution has crucial geostrategic implications for contemporary U.S. foreign and security policy. So I'll come back to these paradoxes at the end. But let me share with you now my argument about the best and the worst of times. If we turn to focus to the period of the last 30 years, the last three decades at face value appear to apply the best of times, a golden age, an epoch of belief, a season of life, a spring of hope for the ecumenical patriarchate. And I say this for three reasons. It's helpful for us to think a little bit about recent and as Dr. Ted um, helped us long history. Now in terms of recent history, first, the two year period from 1981 to 1989 to 1991 that saw the end of the Cold War with the collapse of European state socialist regimes that comprised the communist bloc the fall of the Berlin Wall, almost the anniversary, almost to today's date, actually November 9th, 1989, and culminating in the peaceful self-dissolution self of the Soviet Union in 1991, created a paradigm shift in the possibilities for the ecumenical patriarchy as the leader of the world's global community of approximately 250 to 260 Orthodox Christian believers. Because for the first time in 70 years, the Orthodox churches of the former communist bloc countries were able to communicate, to cooperate, to engage with, to get to know their co-religionists in the other old world autocephalous churches. The ecumenical patriarchate with primacy of honor, Protea, and prerogatives, Presvia, began to accelerate the slow process of preparation for a holy and great council. This had begun as far back as 1902, when then ecumenical patriarch Joachim III issued an, issued an encyclical calling for the autocephalous churches to begin thinking about the need and the prospects for a holy and great council. So in short, the international relations paradigm shift beyond bipolarity, that was the end of the Cold War, was also an ecclesiastical paradigm shift uh, it ushered in a spring of hope for the realization of a global, cohesive, ecclesially integrated Orthodox Church led by the Ecumenical Patriarchate. Another reason for uh, this moment of hope, the epoch of hope and, and period of light, uh, since, Patriarch's, uh, since Bartholomew's election to the Ecumenical Patriarchate in 1991, when he became Patriarch in 1991, he's undertaken a tenure that has been by all measures remarkable for the breadth and scope of commitment to a theology of public engagement and transformational impact. By mining Orthodox Christian theology, he's helped develop conceptual and practitioner responses to some of the most urgent issues of our time. For example, he's helped to tackle uh, climate disruption and climate change by launching his environmental initiatives, earning him the moniker of the Green Patriarch. 
He's creating platforms for cooperation and knowledge, a knowledge exchange between religion and science. He's given voice to international religious freedom as a universal human right in accordance with the Universal Declaration of Human Right. He's advanced ecumenical initiatives to repair and resolve, especially, the fractured state of Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic Christianity. And he's established a task force on modern slavery to raise awareness and take action to combat one of the greatest sins of our current times, slavery and slavery. And then finally, he's convened the Holy and Great Council of the Orthodox Church in Crete in 2016. And I was honored to be part of the, the delegation of the Ecumenical Patriarchy, one of four women at that council. Hopefully the next council will have many more women there. Um, the third reason to celebrate this moment of light for the Ecumenical Patriarchy and for global orthodoxy um, it concerns the, the enormous shift in the self-awareness and the operation of the Orthodox Church as a global church. And this is a self-consciousness that I witnessed at the Holy and Great Council in Crete. Diasporas no longer are separate from mother churches. Indeed, the notion of center-periphery, uh, old world, new world, is gradually being replaced by a transnational ecclesial reality. Advances in technologies of communications and media, transportation and travel, these are all associated with what we know as the phenomenon of globalization, have enabled all Orthodox Christians, from Hawaii to Hong Kong, from Athens, Georgia to Athens, Greece, from Boston to Beijing, to see and to know each other under the aegis and authority of the Ecumenical Patriarchy of Constantinople. And for, therefore, for faithful and all patriarchates on all parts of the planet to work together to advance their responsibility and their mission as Orthodox Christians, protecting human dignity and advancing freedom, as Father James so eloquently uh, observed in, in our prayer this evening. So this description of the past three decades suggests actually the best of times, a moment of belief and a season of light for the Fanar as the lighthouse and beacon of global orthodoxy. But paradoxically, the ecumenical patriarch patriarchy today confronts a series of actors, dynamics, and forces that I would argue constitute the greatest existential threat to the survival of the See of St. Andrew since its founding by St. Andrew in 38 AD, since the establishment of the patriarchy in 451, and since the Queen of Cities, Constantinople, fell on May 29, 1453, to the conquering Ottoman forces. It's the nature, the scope, the simultaneity, and the intersectionality, the nature, the scope, the simultaneity, and the interconnectedness of these threats that makes them a clear and present danger to the vitality, durability, and survival of the patriarchy. And furthermore, Americans should care, especially Orthodox Christians, but all Americans, about these threats because they have implications for U.S. foreign and security policy, for U.S. foreign and security priorities, and for America's soft power claims that rely on a commitment to the protection of universal human rights and values. So let me use the, re the remainder of my time to talk about these threats. I'm going to give a synoptic sketch of these threats. Um, but I am going to go from 10,000 feet into the weeds, so I'll, I'll offer some broad outlines and then some granularity with each of the main threats. Uh, the first threat is what I would call the captivity of the ecumenical patriarchy in Turkey. The current day captivity of the Fenar began half a millennium ago with the Ottoman conquest of the Byzantine Empire. But the Fenar's one century lifespan since the establishment of, of the Republic of Turkey in 1923 has done little to change the reality, whereby the ecumenical patriarchy endures a captive existence within the territorial geography of a state that, whether under 70 years of Kemalist, self-styled secular regimes, or under the past 17 years of Islamist regimes, led by autocrat Recep Tayyip Erdogan, has been systematically dedicated to the destruction of the, of the patriarchy and to the erasure of the living presence and all physical expressions of Orthodox Christianity in Turkey. Indeed, the, the ecumenical patriarchate and Greek Orthodox Christians today in Turkey are the equivalent of a hostage population. 
They're emblematic of the same condition that afflicts the country's other historic Christian populations, mentioned in the Armenian Genocide Bill that Congressman Bilirak has helped to co-sponsor. Armenian Apostolic and Syriac Orthodox Christians, as well as other Christian communities of Roman Catholics and Protestants, the Jewish community, and any Muslim communities that are considered non-conforming to Sufi Islam. For example, Turkey's estimated uh, 16 million Alevis. Now, the conditions of open persecution through episodic violence, pogroms, and expulsions that followed Turkey's founding on the genocide of Christians have been combined with a century of what I would argue are more complex forms of institutionalized discrimination. And I think those are more pernicious and things that we need to take note of. Uh, they're more pernicious than open violence because they're not easily visible. Uh, they're frequently cloaked under the banner of legislation, so cloaked as laws, but they've generated an overall system of oppression and repression that I think constitutes the greatest, most direct threat to the daily existence and long-term survival of the patriarchy. Some might quibble with, uh, with that argument, uh, but I, I want to uh, use some examples to sort of support my claim. Um, and argue also that there's been a, a qualitative shift in the threat matrix that confronts the FNAR because of these nonviolent forms of institutionalized discrimination. And these are things that I saw, uh, you know, in my eight years of diplomatic service on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, but have seen as an academic and policymaker and practitioner over the last 25 years. I want to focus on one particular type of institutionalized discrimination because it's emblematic of what happens to all communities, Christian communities in Turkey, and more generally across the greater Middle East and North Africa, and in fact, more generally worldwide, where vulnerable religious minorities in majoritarian states oftentimes labor under seemingly uh, uh, legal uh, restrictions that make it impossible for them to survive. So in the last 17 years, we've seen in Turkey uh, governance under the Justice and Development Party. Any casual consumer of current news, I think, should be aware of the devolution of Turkey's system of governance since the election of the AKP in November 2002 uh, for one of secular nationalist authoritarianism. And I emphasize that because the moniker of secular democratic for Turkey was never accurate. This was a secular, nationalist, authoritarian, quasi-democratic at best regime. But to the present, Stalinesque regime of Islamist national totalitarianism. Now the consequences of this devolution in the Turkish political regime have been especially grievous for the ecumenical patriarchy. Um, this, there's been a kind of separate and unequal regime uh, which uh, creates the illusion of equality before the state, but in fact is, is is nothing further from the truth. And I want to talk a little bit then about the, uh, the tactic of, the century-long tactic of expropriation and destruction of community religious properties, as well as the appropriation and historical renarration of religious and cultural heritage of the ecumenical patriarchy. Now, these, these tactics amount to what I've called the threat of memoricide, namely the erasure of the historical memory of the Fanar. When the people are gone, all that's left in terms of memory are those institutions, churches, monasteries, museums, libraries, all of the sites that attest to the fact that once there were a people there. And so the expropriation, the repurposing, and the destruction of that physical property is part of a process of genocide the erasure of memory, called a memory sign. That's how I've called it. And I want to give a few examples, because I think they're instructive. And they speak again to the threat of being captive in Turkey. First is the commercialization of ecumenical patriarchy properties. An example, the conversion of the uh, breathtaking Cappadocian monastic cells and chapels. These are architectural wonders that are carved into the soft, tough landscape of, that, of Cappadocia their conversion into hotels that host visitors from around the world and are used by Turkey's National Tourist Association to generate revenues with hot air balloon travel offered to these hotels. In fact, the center of, uh, these, these sites were the center of fourth century monasticism during the time of St. Basil. 
but they're now turned into revenue generating commercial properties. A second example of cultural appropriation and erasure, uh, and I think we're going to see this played out in 2021, concerns the, the theft of historical patrimony that's repackaged as Turkish that was once Byzantine Orthodox. The preparations for the 24th, Inter 24th International Congress of Byzantine Studies, scheduled to be held in Istanbul in, uh, in 2021, is another example of, of this phenomenon. The conference will claim Byzantine history as Turkey's cultural heritage. It will involve the appropriation of all that is Orthodox and that belongs to the ecumenical patriarchy as Turkish. Uh, after all, the Turkish regime refuses to recognize the ecumenicity of the Patriarchate and instead insists that His All Holiness is simply the Bishop of Istanbul. If you go to the, uh, the Horror Church of the Holy Savior, uh, what Turkey calls the Akadia Museum, you'll see active renovations underway at the Horror Church in Istanbul's uh, Edirne Kapi neighborhood, and this is part of the preparation for the aforementioned conference. Now, the significance of this church is that it hosts some of the most unique icons of the Byzantine Renaissance iconographic tradition. They're already being repurposed for their presentation, or I should say, re-presentation to the world, to the world of Byzantine studies, scholars, and tourists as Turkish cultural and religious patrimony, further occluding the historical and living presence of the ecumenical patriarchy. And this also contributes to the rewriting of Turkish history in a fashion that makes what is distinctly Orthodox Christian into nothing more than a dimension of Turkishness. Now, a final example of cultural heritage manipulation and memoricide concerns the Turkish state's academic mission that was recently sent to Greece to demand the return of metal objects, manuscripts, and garments to Sumela Monastery. Now, according to Turkey's Ministry of Culture, these objects, quote, belong to Turkish cultural heritage, and they were taken abroad illegally. Now, of course, in 1922, the Turks destroyed the monastery. They robbed it of its precious objects. They set the monastery on fire, and Byzantine Orthodox monks associated with the patriarchy salvaged whatever sacred artifacts they could and took them with them in the exodus of 1923. So this cultural and religious heritage appropriation is only one part of the non-violent, pernicious assault on the ecumenical patriarchy, and it's part of the larger strategy of domestic Islamization and the foreign policy of neo-Ottomanism of the current Turkish state. And it behooves us to focus on things that we don't necessarily see. We need to see in different ways than we're used to. Visibility and invisibility are important here. These are things that are associated with uh, that may not be associated with violence, but they're a kind of violence insofar as they amount to the eradication and the a threat to the sustainability of the ecumenical patriarchy. So I'll stop here. Oh, that's a first example, the captivity. The second threat is what I would call the Russian state's deployment of the Russian Orthodox Church as a soft power tool and the Moscow patriarchate's global activism that's aimed at displacing the ecumenical patriarchate's privacy and prerogatives as the leader of the world's Orthodox faithful. Now, this is, a, a, for an Orthodox Christian, I find this a very painful, but it's a reality that needs to be confronted. And the simultaneity of this first threat, the captivity to a hostile Turkish state and an antagonistic, increasingly antagonistic Turkish society, simultaneous with this second threat, helps to explain the potential lethality for the sustainability of the Fanar. Let me uh, say a little bit about what the Russian state is doing. It's using religion as a soft power tool to expand Russia's geopolitical influence. Thank you so much. The Russian state is using religion as a soft power tool to expand Russia's geopolitical influence and what, Russia, and what Moscow calls the Ruskimir, or the Russian world. Now, once upon a time, the Ruskimir, the Russian world, was considered the near abroad, namely those states within the territory of the former Soviet Union. But the Ruskimir has now taken on a grander geopolitical scope in the post-Cold War period. It's, and in particular in the last uh, 15 years, it's focused on Russian dominance in Eurasia as intrinsic 
to Russia's revival as a global superpower. Accordingly, the Russian state's handmaiden in this project is the Patriarchate of Moscow of the Russian Orthodox Church, or the Orthodox Church of Russia. After all, the project of Russia's geopolitical hegemony also implies a religio-cultural challenge for Russia to be taken seriously as a great power, a competitor to the United States and to its transatlantic allies. Russia presents itself as, itself as a, a religio-cultural alternative, a challenge to Western values that are presented as secularist, atheistic, hyper-liberal, and disruptive of the traditional values or conservative values, because these terms are used interchangeably, that are necessary for social cohesion and order. And the platform and vehicle for that religio-cultural challenge is the Orthodox Church of Russia, directed by the very capable Patriarch of Moscow, uh, Patriarch Kirill, and through the well-funded Office of External Relations under the direction of Metropolitan Hilarion. Now sadly, as I said earlier, from an Orthodox perspective, this geopolitical and geocultural program have meant that the Russian Orthodox Church has emerged as a clear and present danger to the phenomenon on the basis of malign activities that enjoy, at the very least, the indirect support of the Russian state. Let me say a little bit again to get granular about these malign activities of the Patriarchate of Moscow. And in discussion and Q&A, I'd be happy to drill down into more detail. The Patriarchate of Moscow's malign activities include, but are not limited to, media, information, and cyber information operations. And they've been directed at a single goal, undermining the legitimacy of the ecumenical patriarchate as the leader of global orthodoxy. This degrading of the status and the brand of the ecumenical patriarchate has been undertaken within the global orthodox ecclesiastical ecosystem, in ecumenical circles as well, and especially in terms of Moscow's relations with the Vatican and Moscow's relations, the Patriarchate of Moscow's relations with U.S. evangelical Protestant groups with political capital. Um, but beyond hybrid virtual information activities, the Moscow Patriarchate has also used and is using a vast network of what we would call faith-based organizations. And even, and this may be too harsh a term, but I'll throw it out there anyway for uh, sake of provocative discussion, uh, the weaponization of church open buildings and openings, church uh, refurbishments, in order to undermine, compete with, and generally aim to weaken the capacity, authority, and legitimacy of the Fanar as the first among equals in global orthodoxy. And these claims have been made quite bluntly uh, and straightforwardly by uh, Moscow Patriarch Kirill and by Director of External Affairs Metropolitan Hilarion, uh, and the argument is very simple. They say, given the small numbers of Orthodox Christian, Greek Orthodox Christian faithful inside Turkey, notice that they adhere to and hold the lines of the Turkish state's argument that uh, the ecumenical patriarch's flock is limited to Turkey, okay? They argue, given the small numbers of or Greek Orthodox Christians in Turkey, and given their lack of freedom, ironically, the result of Turkish captivity, uh, this justifies the relocation and the recalibration of global Orthodox authority away from Constantinople and to Moscow. Accordingly, they use the trope of Moscow as the third Rome, replacing the new Rome that was Constantinople. That formulation of the third Rome in and of itself is a deviation from the notion of the second, uh, of the new Rome. Constantinople was never the second Rome, it was the new Rome. So let me move from, again, the general to even more specific and tell you a little bit how this threat functions, and especially to position what seems to be a parochial Orthodox Christian story within the framework of contemporary high-stakes geopolitics. And it's important, again, to recognize the reflexivity and the amplification at work between the threats from Turkey and those from the Moscow Patriarchate. Because the disinformation and delegitimation attacks of the Patriarchate of Moscow have been facilitated by the Russia-Turkey Tactical Partnership, which has been a real disruptor in Turkey's already frayed relationship with its Western partners in NATO. And there are a lot of reasons for that, which from my perspective are overwhelmingly due to 
uh, to Ankara's behavior. But what this means is that the goals of the Moscow Patriarchate and the Russian state have provided Ankara with another tool for its own assault on the Fanar. Now, the most obvious example, uh, and one that many of you may have heard of, and I'm sorry I keep moving around, but this is the perils of being tall. Has anybody come up with a podium that can rise and fall? If you haven't, do it, get a patent, and you'll be wealthy beyond belief. Tall people like me will forever think. Um, so the most obvious example. The Moscow-based website, Oriental Review, published an article accusing the ecumenical patriarchate of involvement in the July 2016 coup attempt against the Arab government using a fraudulent set of claims by former U.S. ambassador, supposedly by former U.S. ambassador to Yemen, Arthur Hughes, to perpetrate the conspiracy theory. In other words, the ecumenical patriarch sitting in his office at the Fanar, uh, you know, manufactured and oversaw the entire coup attempt against the Erdogan government. So they perpetrated the conspiracy theory uh, through cyber, uh, uh, through the internet, through this website, Oriental Review, and they also argued that um, the positive relations between Fethullah Gulen, the, uh, the Turkish cleric who uh, sought political asylum and lives in Pennsylvania, and ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew was further evidence of uh, the Fanar's perfidy. Now the article in the Russian blogosphere was then recycled through Turkish pro-government newspapers, in particular uh, the pro-state-owned uh, state newspaper Aksam, under a headline on August 30th that read, The Patriarchy CIA Gulen Alliance. And that article basically argued that His All Holiness Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew was a CIA uh, asset and a Gulenist stooge. And that's the kind of language they use. That's not my language. Now, the use of information warfare to promote the Russia Turkey tactical partnership against the West. And uh, this is something outlined in a fantastic uh, Rand Corporation re re report. And to target the ecumenical patriarchate as an enemy of Turkey, and therefore um, as an institution that was not credible to re represent global orthodoxy, shows the way in which information warfare is linked to geopolitics. The other thing that's very interesting here is that the timing of this disinformation uh, operation was significant. The recycling of the original Russian language blog post into Turkish newspapers occurred on the 61st anniversary of the September 6-7 pogrom against Istanbul's Greek Orthodox minority communities, known as the September events, the September Yana. And in case anyone doesn't recall what happened then, more than 5,000 properties were damaged, including 71 churches, 41 schools, eight newspapers, 4,000 plus stores, businesses, 2,000 residences were looted, 30 people were dead, hundreds were injured, and hundreds were raped. And what is, has been called by uh, Turkish uh, social scientist Ikan Erdemir, a very good friend, uh, the Kristallnacht uh, for Greek Orthodox Christians in Turkey. So the recycling, notice the connections, Russian blogosphere in Russian, using disinformation, a fraudulent report and quotes by uh, a former U.S. ambassador. He publicly uh, uh, went on record saying that these were not his quotes. The recycling then to the Turkish blogosphere in Turkish, into the Turkish mainstream press, state-owned mainstream press, and the timing of all of this on the eve of the September events. And recall that the September events themselves with a product of a disinformation campaign started by the then government in Ankara that falsely reported, well, they set a, a bomb at the, uh, the home of Ataturk, of Mustafa Kemal, in Thessaloniki, and they uh, reported that this was set by Greeks. In fact, uh, this was set by agents of the Turkish state. So disinformation continues, but in a, a postmodern form, in this case, using cyber warfare. Now, this, these efforts, I think, uh, make clear the way that Moscow uh, is using malign uh, activities to undermine the legitimacy and to, um, to uh, place at risk the ecumenical patriarchy. Other things that are instructive as well. For example, 
um, the role of the Moscow Patriarchate to play spoiler in boycotting the Holy and Great Council in Crete in 2016. That was a move that also included the Patriarchate of Antioch, Georgia, and the Church of Bulgaria. Uh, the claims by Moscow then, uh, that, uh, the Holy and Great Council was neither holy nor great nor legitimate because four churches uh, did not participate. Those have been disseminated around the planet in Orthodox blogospheres, in ecumenical blogospheres, and in crossover religion and politics uh, sites. So there's this chronic, constant effort to undermine the legitimacy of the pr and primacy of the ecumenical patriarchy. Um, and then finally, just a, another example, and, I, and, and the uh, Moscow patriarchy uses all manner of financial and other kinds of incentives uh, in order to try to uh, curry favor and influence other Orthodox churches. The recent, most recent example of this uh, relates to the granting of autocephaly to the Orthodox Church of Ukraine by the Ecumenical Patriarchate. Uh, not only has Moscow uh, characterized this as a blow to global orthodoxy, an attempt by Constantinople to behave in a papal, way, in a papal fashion, um, but uh, the Moscow Patriarchate has used, again, its various modes of financial and other forms of incentives and influence to try and prevent other Orthodox churches from recognizing the autocephaly of Ukraine as well. Um, and that includes uh, veiled and direct threats to open as many new Russian-speaking churches as possible in, uh, uh, in spaces, for example, in Greece, in Israel, in Palestine, in Syria, and in the United States. Uh, in Western Europe uh, as a kind of threat, what they argue is a threat to uh, the strength of the ecumenical patriarchy. And these are all very sad because they speak to the internal fragmentation of the Orthodox Church. I'll get to that in a moment. But the fact of the matter is, these are malign activities by the Moscow Patriarchy that occur in tandem with the actions of the Turkish state and that constitute a real existential threat uh, to the uh, to the Fanar. Uh, it's interesting for those of you who may know that uh, Metropolitan Epiphania of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine visited uh, New York, I think it was three weeks ago, to uh, be awarded the Athena Horus Human Rights uh, Award. At the same time that he was in New York receiving that award, and then the next day celebrating liturgy with, uh, with Archbishop Bivaforos of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese, Metropolitan Hilarion from the Moscow Patriarchate made a trip to New York as well and co-celebrated liturgy that same morning with Metropolitan Joseph of the Antiochian Orthodox Church. And when um, Metropolitan Epiphania made his way down to Washington for a series of meetings, some of which I, one of which I was uh, fortunate enough to be present at, uh, Metropolitan Hilarion also made the trek down to Washington. Uh, so, uh, you know, the logic, I think, and the implications are clear. I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, and this brings me then to the third and final threat, and then to conclusion. And I'll be very brief here with the third threat. Uh, but the competition and the malign activities by Moscow against the ecumenical patriarchy uh, speak to a, a third threat from my perspective, and that relates to the uh, condition of orthodox unity or disunity within the United, within the United States. And why do I focus on this in particular? Um, largely because the Orthodox churches in the United States are really the churches that have had the longest record of freedom. They've not suffered under uh, Ottoman, historically under the Ottoman experience. They didn't suffer for seven decades under the Bolsheviks in Eastern Europe. Um, these churches, including the Patriarchate of Moscow, these are martyred churches, uh, decades of uh, suffering under the, the Bolsheviks, nor do they continue to suffer in the unfree conditions in, um, in uh, secular and uh, Islamist authoritarian countries in the Middle East. So the churches here in the United States are free, protected by the First Amendment and generally by uh, our democratic polity. So the churches here in, in some ways have a special responsibility from my perspective to do everything they can to advocate, certainly for the survival and the health of the ecumenical patriarchy, but more generally for their fellow Orthodox Christians worldwide and to stand up for freedom of conscience, belief, and religion for all people, uh, regardless of their faith tradition worldwide. That responsibility and that capacity to be 
active in advocacy and giving voice to the needs for protection and support means that unity amongst the Orthodox churches in the United States becomes uh, more important than ever. A house divided against itself cannot stand. We know that. And if, as Orthodox Christians, we truly believe that we are one in, in terms of our ecclesial body, um, if my arm is beating my chest, then I'm hurting my body. If I'm trying to cut off one part of the church, if there's a schism, I'm cutting off one limb from my body. That cannot produce a healthful outcome, to put it in very elemental terms. So the lack of um, orthodox unity, the uh, denominalization and the fragmentation of orthodox churches in the United States, I would argue constitutes an existential threat for the ecumenical patriarchy because it weakens the capacity of churches here to advocate for the survival and protection of that church and by extension to do the same for other Orthodox churches which themselves are vulnerable to extinction. So these are the three uh, issues that I would argue are the uh, current existential threats for the patriarchy. They exist simultaneously, they, uh, they are connected to one another, and they, uh, they are broad in scope and they're deep in complexity. And ironically or paradoxically, they exist at the same time as the three points that I made at the beginning that constitute the best of times, the greatest moment of potential for the patriarchy. And there's the paradox. Now the other paradox is most Americans, as Dr. Ted said at the beginning, either know nothing or care little about the condition of the ecumenical patriarchy. And I would wager that many Orthodox Christians either know little or worse still are potentially apathetic. I'll put it in those terms. We, we don't do enough. Now, why should everyone care? Why should Orthodox Christians care? And why should all American citizens care? I'll give you a, a few bullet points by way of conclusion. First of all, why uh, Orthodox Christians should care, I think I made clear. Um, we should care not only in terms of the Fanar itself, but also because the Fanar is instructive for all of the endangered Orthodox churches in the Middle East. The four ancient Pentarchy, the four ancient churches in the east part of the Pentarchy that Dr. Ted described, they are in danger of extinction. That's not hyperbole, that's reality. And if you've ever traveled to any of to Damascus, to Jerusalem, to Bethlehem, to Constantinople, to Istanbul, you'll see that. I mean, I've been to those places, and it's not hyperbole to say that these are churches are in danger of extinction. But they themselves are also emblematic. They matter not just because they're about Orthodox Christians, but they are a cautionary tale for other vulnerable Christian communities and for vulnerable Muslim communities, Yazidi communities, Baha'i communities, for vulnerable peoples of all faith persuasions. So Americans need to care because the Fanar is instructive. And it's instructive about a logic of homogenization that produces the elimination of vulnerable communities. And one day, our vulnerable community will be your vulnerable community and your vulnerable community. So we need to take note for that reason as American citizens who believe in freedom of conscience, belief, and, and religion. Second reason we need to take, uh, take um, interest in what's happening with the patriarchy concerns our own foreign and security policy. Uh, the issues that I outline with regard to Turkey, and we could go on and on, unfortunately indicate um, the behavior of a NATO member state and a putative NATO ally that neither protects and uh, adheres to NATO's strategic interests and certainly doesn't support NATO as a community of values. NATO is supposed to be a, a collective uh, uh, it's a, a, a alliance, it's a collective security alliance. Turkey's behavior does not enhance, in fact, it's detracting from uh, American security and American security priorities. And Turkey's behaviors vis-a-vis -vis the ecumenical patriarchy, and by extension, its other religious minority communities, uh, does not in any way resemble the values um, that are meant to uh, make the NATO alliance cohere. So there's a, a strategic imperative for thinking about what's going on with the patriarchy. Next reason. If we think about the ecumenical patriarchate and more broadly, the Orthodox churches in the old world, the mother churches, look at a map and you'll see a triangle from Constantinople from Turkey uh, into southeastern Europe, up into Ukraine and the former Soviet, and to Moscow, the former Soviet space. That strategic, that geography there, 
um, is the, the connector space between Europe and Asia. It's, it's the Eurasian heartland. And the, the volatility there is not only about military volatility, it's not only about political regime type, it's also a space of economic, uh, of religious, uh, and, uh, excuse me, religious pluralism and religious competition. Religious institutions can exercise and exert either a, a peaceful, cohesive impact in society or a disruptive impact. And so it's important to pay attention to what's happening with those Orthodox churches, and in particular, the ecumenical patriarchy, which historically, throughout the Cold War, and now in the post-Cold War period, has never once deviated in its commitment to the preservation and protection of human dignity and human freedom, and all of the values that we in the United States associate with healthy, robust democracy. So the survival of the patriarchate in that regard is about giving voice to a religious leader who enjoys respect in a region where those kinds of values are uh, not, uh, not universally adhered to. And then finally, two more points. Why should Americans care? I think as American citizens, it's absolutely important for us to live up to what we say we're committed to, namely the protection of universal human rights. Uh, that's part of our soft power as the United States. If we want other countries to take us seriously, to want to be like us, that's what soft power is about, we need to not only talk the talk, but walk the walk. We have an entire machinery now in our foreign policy establishment that's committed to the protection of international religious freedom. For people to take that machinery seriously, we need to actually respond to what's happening to the patriarchy. And then finally, I think there's a domestic imperative for us to think about what's happening to the ecumenical patriarchy. The logic of the threats that I describe to the patriarchy, in particular those from Turkey and Russia, are, uh, involve a logic of intolerance, a logic of uh, acceptance of violence, a logic of separate and unequal, a logic of institutionalized discrimination. These are, these are ways of behavior these are political behaviors and institutions that run counter to everything that we, the United States of America, stand for. And how we behave outside reflects on how we think and act inside, and vice versa. So I think there's also a domestic imperative for us to stand up to those kinds of activities that constitute, as I said at the beginning, uh, the most serious existential threat to the survival of the ecumenical patriarchy since the fall of Constantinople in 1453. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Elizabeth. That was an incredibly eloquent and insightful analysis. And I really can't thank you enough. Those of you who know me um, know that I spent a year in the Air Force in Turkey, in the Air Force Base in Injilid. And I have to tell you that I got to know a lot of Turkish people. And I don't hate Turkish people. I think Turkish people have been some of the nicest, most gracious, hospitable people that I've ever met. But I'm appalled and I hate the policies of the Turkish government and what they're doing to our people and our patriarchy. The stranglehold that they have on them, like Elizabeth said, th that squeezes the very life out of our community, our, our heritage, is just, it's, it's evil. The fact that they won't let us train our own priests, but yet they won't let us bring them in from somewhere else. The fact that uh, they won't allow the, the ecumenical patriarch, and a title he's had since 451, to call himself the ecumenical patriarch. He's just the Bishop of Istanbul, as Dr. Elizabeth said. The fact that we had 8,000 properties in 1923 that supported the ecumenical patriarch, donations from Greek Orthodox Christians that have been insidiously taken away by the Turkish government so that now there's less than 500. How did they do this? Well, they made a rule that the patriarchy can't own property, so they had to form these little committees of Greek Orthodox citizens that took care of the properties. But if somebody died, they couldn't be replaced. And if a property went into disrepair, just try to get 
up license. Just try to get a permit to repair it. And then when you can't get the permit after a while, guess what? It's a decrepit property. It's a blight. So the, the state appropriates it, then they sell it, and then it goes. So it, it's, it's really institutional evil that keeps us from being able to survive. There's so many. I mean, the, 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 the Halki school that's been closed since 1971, the, the school that trained all our patriarchs and many of our, our priests, many of whom are still here in the United States today. This is terrible. But I don't let, it, let me hate the Turkish people. But we cannot allow what's happening. We cannot al not allow Hagia Sophia, Hora, or any of our properties, uh, uh, any of our heritage sites to be taken away again. Uh, I have, you know, I, um, I told some friends last night, I have very good Turkish friends, one of whom to me is like a brother, an orthopedic surgeon in Adana, Turkey. And after one night that we were out and really enjoying ourselves, and uh, he says to me, he says, I don't understand why our people have, are fighting. We're like brothers, the Greeks, the Turks, we, we were like brothers living in the same house for 400 years. And I smiled and I looked at him and I said, yes, my friend, but it was our house and we didn't invite you. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, they have an interesting perspective on things and sometimes we have to kind of enlighten them on, on maybe a more realistic perspective. Um, I want to thank Elizabeth again for, for coming down. It, it was a wonderful presentation. Thank you for everything you do. You are um, a great supporter of the patriarchy and for religious freedom, and we're really honored by your presence. I want to thank Holy Trinity for allowing us to use the facilities and for co-sponsoring this. Of course, I want to thank Congressman Bill Arakas and his staff, Liz Hitos. Where are you, Liz? I know you were instrumental in, 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 in organizing this and inviting people as well. Uh, and the, in, the Congressional International Religious Freedom Caucus, thank you, Gus, for establishing that, for leading it, and for championing the causes of religious freedom, not only for our people, but for all people. And that's very important. Thank you. God bless you. I want to thank all of you for taking time out tonight to come to do this. You'll notice that there's a lot of papers on your, on your seats. These are all uh, for you to take home, and feel free to take the ones next to you that nobody's using, okay? But one caveat, you have to give it to somebody else. You have to. I'm, I'm, I'm making you apostles of religious freedom to go out and tell somebody else what's going on, because they do no good on the chairs, they do no good in the closet or in a drawer, they only do good if you read it and your neighbors read it, and we take action on that. Because, as somebody said once before, you know, when they come after one group and another group and another group and nobody objects, eventually they come for you. And we can't let that happen. All right, finally, I want to thank my mother for making baklava because that's really important and everybody's going to get to try some. I want to thank my wife and her friends for um, setting up the refreshments that is donated by the Archons. And I'd like to thank her especially for giving up her birthday today for us to have this. And along with, along with Carolyn Criticos, Mary Criticos' wife, please stand up. Your birthday as well. No.